Hello everyone, it's Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore here. Welcome to the Music Masterclass. So, uh, I am here at my keyboard today uh, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing a lot of keyboard stuff over the next few weeks and we're getting uh, in the spirit. And there's some piano pieces I want to look at. Um, so, uh, we are going to be t looking at some of the pieces you've submitted here, and I want to give you a preview of my Jazz Piano Holiday course because I got to do that. Um, if you see the link at the top of the chat, that's uh, my uh, the, the school where I've got all my online courses. Go ahead and click there. You'll find the uh, Jazz Piano um, uh, course there with a little ad at the top. Um, and well, I'll talk about that some and put the link up later. But let's let's uh, let's not uh, start off with that. Let's uh, start off by uh, talking a little bit about some of the music that has been submitted here. And I need to again check my. Uh... Um, and yeah, there well, we I'll go. Okay, fine. Um, so uh, yeah, there's been a lot of music submitted lately that um, it's been interesting to see like dialogues between uh, composers basically. Someone posts a piece and then someone takes it and says, hey, I want to take that piece and do uh, something else with it. And there's uh, been, yeah, a few really nice examples of that lately. And so I want to uh, focus on a couple of those and, um, and a couple other things. So um, I'm going to be putting my phone where I can actually see the chat. There we go. Um, so that'll be uh, useful. This setup isn't as good for that, I guess. But at my keyboard works. OK, so um, I'm going to load up a score or two or three. And um, so this poem in A minor that we looked at last time uh, then has a new version by Sam that's uh, so Trevor has the original composition in this new arrangement um, uh, by Sam, uh, Sam Hoppertsbach. Um, I never know how to actually pronounce that name. Sorry, Sam. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, so I'm going to, we, we talked about this piece at length last time, and I just want to take a look at some of the things that Sam did, because he, he actually um, did a nice job of kind of uh, mm, pointing out some of the differences that that you know things he did differently so i'm just going to start at the beginning of this piece it's uh you know on the longer side and we're just going to look at little pieces of it so here's the beginning of it i'll play it for a little while then we'll listen to the uh the uh rearrangement of it i'm actually going to start that over because the intro is significant i had the volume down low I'll stop it there. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, yeah, it's just a really lovely piece on my Trevor. And I see uh, Colleen has a comment about the video being blurry. It looks fine on my phone, so it, I don't, could be maybe your internet connection, but other people can feel free to chime in um, and let me know. But uh, as far as I can tell, it seems, um, it seems okay from where I'm sitting. All right. So that's the uh, original piece. And now I'm going to play you the beginning of uh, Sam's arrangement here.
And that feels like the same place. All right, excellent. Yeah, I, I just, I love how it's a a different arrangement um, and yet <clears throat> is very obviously still the same, uh, the same piece. And so actually this speaks to uh, maybe the distinction that one might make normally between an arrangement and an orchestration. I'm doing the air quotes thing here, um, where Typically, if we talk about an arrangement, we're expecting there to be some significant differences to how the accompaniment is organized. Maybe, excuse me, maybe new chords involved, um, new rhythms, you know, th you know, things like that we might expect to be different. And if we talk about an orchestration of a piece, you know, this is what happens if we take, say, a solo piano piece and then want to write it for a full orchestra. Um, or for a string quartet or any other thing. And then you're making decisions about how to take the original piece and make it work for different instrumentation, specifically larger instrumentation. Because then there's transcription, which um, in the jazz world, we use the word transcription to mean um, uh, the idea of listening to a recording and writing down what you hear from the recording. It's how we learn improvised solos and also how we learn jazz tunes because they're usually not published anywhere. Um, but transcription in the classical world usually means a little bit of the opposite. It's, it's taking an orca, what's well, not the opposite, but taking an, a large score like an orchestra score and reducing it down to just piano or maybe guitar, taking a, something that was originally written for one instrument and changing it to be written for a different instrument, maybe changing from piano to guitar or guitar to piano, where some of the things can be done the same way, but the ranges of the instruments are different, the number of notes you can play at once is different, things about it is different, so you have to make some allowances. So what, what's interesting about Sam's version here is it's... Um, it's the same instrumentation, so nothing had to change as far as like thinking of it as an orchestration or a transcription, um, and yet v things did change, but you know relatively little change. It's more the kinds of things one would change in doing uh, an orchestration, which I thought was interesting. So in some ways, it's like reorchestrating the original piece for uh, new um, uh, the same instruments again. <laughs> the only way I can put it is that it's reorchestrating the piece back for the same instruments. So if we look at the differences, he's actually um, kind of outlined them, which is really nice. So first thing is he made the intro twice as long. So the original intro, which is why I wanted to start it over there, was only two measures, right? So the um, the, the new introduction is four measures. But not only that, he also changed these three notes, right? The original had a, a melodic line there. <clears throat> the new version is so it's um, one and five. So this is clearer harmonically, I guess, in that it's a one and a five and a one, and it makes sense as like a bass line sort of thing. It feels more um, expected? I don't know. And also, the E's, that sound here, um, because the pedal is down, that low A is still sounding, so we're hearing the A, the E's, on top of the A. And that's not dissonant at all, right? It's this. I mean, it's muddy, it's dark, but, you know, we're going for dark, so that's fine. But, 
the original version had a melodic line there and because the pedal is down these notes are being heard over that low A and it's a little more ominous. Right? We're hearing the low A while we hear all that stuff there. So it's it's a dark er sound if that makes sense. So um, one of the things that uh, Sam's version has done is made it a little less dark I would say um, because now it's roots and fifths and it's not trying to play a melody under pedal and, it, and he made the comment when he posted it not meant to be an improvement just uh, some new ideas and that's great that's that, that is what we're doing and if you don't mind I will tie this over to the, the uh, my jazz piano holiday course our goal isn't to take a song that we all love and make it worse nor is it to make it better it's just to um, do it differently make it personal make it our own and uh, jazz so our own where our own means some amount of jazz to it so already we're, we're imposing something on it but we're imposing <coughs> our own interpretation of what that might mean so um uh what else can i tell you here um he's got the uh um right hand of the piano postponed so in the original version here there's chords right when the melody comes in right when the melody comes in so the melody in the cello is up in a high range and we've got the chords there and Sam has chosen to put that off let's keep the uh, he says let's keep the melody lower and uh, let's not bring in the chords So what's interesting to me about it is in some ways Trevor's introduction was a little more ominous because of that pedal thing. But in some ways Sam's melody is a little more ominous because of the dark the dark register of the cello. Although for that matter really the high register of the cello has a straining quality that also is ominous in some way and those repeated chords there in the piano are ominous in a way. And the fact that we have this E chord sounding over the A, that pedal point thing, um, adds to the ominousness of it. Um, and that's not really happening here, right? We don't see the E chord happening. We just hear the bass. We're, so we're hearing the melody just over the A. So um, yeah, that was an interesting little change. But what it gives him is the ability to kind of control the pacing of it by saying, you know what, I, uh, I'm going to bring in the chords at bar 14. <coughs> Whereas uh, Trevor's bar 14 is actually going to be 12 because remember his intro is two bars shorter. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got some almond, I think, uh, in my throat because I had a handful before I started this. <laughs> um, so uh, this... is uh, what's going on there. Oh, but actually, uh, so there was another change here because I guess uh, that's the thing, repeat theme. So Sam had the theme repeat. So in some ways, Sam's version, and I know he's coming from a, a somewhat of a jazz background, as do I, it fits more of a standard jazz expectation. Let's think about this, four bar intro, total standard jazzism. Having it be basically the one and the five, totally standard jazzism. Not just jazz, but a lot of kind of popular forms um, as opposed to classical forms. This idea of a four bar intro that just basically states a one and a five, yeah, it's really common. And then the idea of stating a melody and then immediately repeating that melody. This is like, you're, where I'm thinking already like it's gonna be an A-A-B-A -A -A form, which is not it's not unique to jazz but it's very typical in jazz and it's eh, in classical but it's yeah in jazz right so the fact that he's repeated the a section but now doing it a little differently he's able to create a you know some additional contrast within that basic eight bar melody here because yeah it's basically an eight bar melody um I think it's technically, if I was to say, it, there's like a ninth bar in there um, just to establish a little more of that pedal point. 
Um, but it's basically an eight bar melody that then uh, repeats here in, in Sam's version. And his version has the piano basically doubling the melody, right? The top note, bum, 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 right? It's doubling on top, but then harmonized below with these block chords, which is another technique I'm going to talk about in my jazz piano course. Um, I like how I got up to the microphone when I said that. Um, okay, so uh, um, this is, yeah, it's just a really nice technique. And when I say, you know, block chord is a jazz piano thing, well, it wouldn't just be triads. We'd be doing other things with it. But the, but the idea of this type of harmonization is one that's really familiar to someone who does that kind of arrangement, but not just that. It's, you know, it's certainly a common, common enough type of harmonization in any uh, style. So it's really a whole new section that, that Sam's given himself to work with, a re repetition of the A section, but a little different in a way that now that the piano's got some right hand stuff, it's more reminiscent of what Trevor had, but not identical. So the piece is long, and if I stick with this level of detail, I'm not gonna get through it, and that's fine. I, 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 I wanna talk more about the idea of what's going on here. Um, then to, uh, since we talked about this piece at length last time, I think I will want to move on. But I, I wanted to just point out these things that are going on here about all these really interesting choices that one can make in taking a song and, uh, or a song or a composition and reimagining it in some way. And this isn't just, uh, this, this is the thing. I mean, this is, there is a large history of that. I mean, certainly of classical composers taking a theme from another composition, another composer, and writing a whole new piece based on just that theme. This is more than that, right? It's not just the melody that uh, Sam is working with here. It's um, really uh, a lot of the specific voicings, this little cluster that happens right here is exactly the same as as what Trevor had. So um, in any case, it's it's a, I, I just love the idea of this, that someone wrote a piece that was great as it was, and someone was inspired by it to say, what can I do with that same material? And that's really an interesting, um, it's an interesting exercise for anyone to do. And uh, you might want to think about doing it with, uh, you know, some favorite classical piece or whatever that you, you know, and just say, what can I do with this? That's not totally rewriting it. Not because uh, this, this is rewritten. Like I said, it's reorchestrated, but a lot of it has stayed the same, but he did add a new statement of the melody and uh, the way he harmonized, oops, this with this, these chords here is, um you know, that's his own, uh, what he brought to the table there. Um, absolutely, there's a ton to be learned from this, and it takes the pressure off of having to come up with your own melody and your own chord progression. Now you're working on just the composition skills or the orchestration skills, <coughs> the arranging skills, depending on how what term you want to use for it. So it, it's a really interesting and useful exercise, and again, ties in very much to what I'll be doing in the jazz piano course. So uh, yeah, I want to encourage people to do this sort of stuff more. It's it's really, really a nice thing. And so um, another example of that was, uh, and I can't actually show this one the way I otherwise would. Um, uh, where I um well, uh, I, I had it on my other computer. Give me a moment. Here we go. Um, if I go over to the community here, um, Heist had his piece that uh, Jim then decided to work with. And the problem is Jim's version is not downloadable, which is pretty typical on, on your pieces. You don't have them set to downloadable. And that's fine. But what it means is... Um, uh, I don't necessarily get to work with the piece. And so I, I do actually have a copy of the piece, but um, I want to just maybe play a little bit of the pieces so we can just, you know, talk about the fact that some of the same stuff is happening here. So this was a theme uh, by Heiss, and 
I just wish I remembered exactly where that was. So I'm going to show you how to use the search thing if you've never used it. Um, I can type at the top the name that I'm looking for. And uh, no post. What? Okay, I accidentally hit the wrong thing. That's because I'm typing onto a computer. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, uh. Is this the one? Nope, that's from four months ago. So anyhow, uh, sorry I don't uh, have that one all queued up there. Um, uh, yeah, that would be great, uh, um, Jim, if you uh, make that downloadable. Um, but uh, I'm going to just bring it, bring up the version that I do have there. Um, this is uh, Jim's version, and I, I, I definitely want to find Heise's melody. If you're, if you're here, maybe you can remind me of what it's <clears throat> actually called. Um, so I can maybe find it a little easier. Um, but uh, mm, 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 I'm just going to scroll here. Melody in A minor. Here we go. Ah, that's the, yeah, that's the problem. It's gone. OK, so uh, this is Jim's piece. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. So I'm going to pause that there only because it's it's a lot to this piece. And I'm, I just want to skip around and point out that then there's a second movement. Um, So already we can talk about the fact that we can hear this melody. Right, that slow melody in the adagio movement. And then in the jig. Right, exact same melody, but now it's recast into 6-8 at a much kind of faster clip. Um, so we get to hear the same melodic material being treated in two different ways. So even without actually seeing Heise's original, um, we, we, we get to see that, yeah, Jim's taken a theme and done two entirely different things with it. And, um, you know, the, the third movement is going to be another treatment of that same thing. So you can see there is that same melody, right? And now it's back into four. Well, it's I, I say back into four. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, it's in four or in two, two, I guess. But it's the same melody. The original statement was in three, right? Um, it's not that... Uh, not that fast, but I wanted to point out where the accents were. By recasting it into four without changing anything or two, um, instead of ba ba do da dum bum, instead of that D, oh, I just snapped right into the microphone, right? Ba do dum ba do dum bum. That's where the downbeats were when it was in 
three. But now that he's put it in four without changing rhythms, um, he's actually totally changed the character of it because boo ba da da do ba do dum ba do da dum feels like a normal three four melody, but. Booba do da do dum booba ba da ba dum feels like totally off kilter. We have a phrase that's ending on beat two. That is not something you see every day. You might not think about the fact that you don't see it every day, but you don't see it every day. And it really causes it to feel off kilter in a way that's totally designed. I mean, you know, look at the title of the piece, humoresque. And um and everything about the um, ba, um, ba is is also designed to to be this um, you know almost circusy type of uh, feel to it. I want to play this next section. So again, it's like playing some kind of games with the rhythm, taking this thing and putting it in other other formats. Now, I do want to actually, and I'm going to keep doing this, don't worry. Uh, I, I want to talk about, when I say this, what I'm going to do is relate this to the Jazz Piano Holiday Course, because this idea of taking a melody that's in three and fourizing it, um, uh, of all the words I've made up before, that is not the most made up -iest. Um <clears throat> But... Um, uh, taking a melody that's in three and putting it in a four is something we do a lot in jazz because we're so used to jazz being in four. And not just in jazz, a lot of other dance kind of oriented styles might want to put things into four that were originally in three. It's really super common. And like if I were to do this and try to make it, so Jim did it by saying, hey, I'm not going to change a thing. I'm just going to move the bar lines and now they'll beat the, the downbeats are going to be different places. Usually what we would do is make it be so that the downbeats are in the same places. So all I did was change the first beat of every measure into a half note. And now it's in four, but the downbeats are still in the same place, right? One, two, three. So that would be one way of moving it into four. But then we do things like um, take that plain half note and two quarters. If we're in a jazz context, we're not going to play a half note and two quarters. We're going to do the jazz things with it. So those of you who are certain of a certain age may remember a guy named Johnny Carson, right? Uh, the predecessor to Jay Leno, who was the predecessor to, now I can't even remember which show is which. Boy, I've, I've, I've kind of lost track of who's, who's the actual Tonight Show now. I guess that's Jimmy Fallon, right? Um, uh, so, um, that, the theme song, um, that was the, the theme. So, one, two, three, boo da ba da boo da so, ba, one, and da do da Ba -da -bum -bum. I'm stealing that rhythm. One and three, four, and just making it happen there. One and three, four, one. So that kind of thing of realizing there's only so many rhythms in the world and only so many ways of syncopating them by moving notes around. That's one of the things that I'll be talking about more um, in the course when I talk about how to like make a rhythm feel jazzier. But that that's one of the things. So not that the goal was to make it jazzier, but it is common outside the world of jazz also to take a piece in three and move it into four, normally by actually changing the rhythms in some way. So, um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, so that was the humoresque, and yeah, these, these are just really fun pieces. And during office hours, I went over these uh, in much more detail, and we talked about some of the more details in them. That's one of the things we get to do in the office hours, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then the last movement here, and this, Jim, you may have updated it since then, but I didn't just download a new version. This is still the version that I downloaded uh, a couple days ago. So the last movement says March, 
But the, the previous movement, the humoresque, had a march-like feel to it. This was the comment I made. This section picks up where that one left off, but then moves on to what I would consider the trio section of a march. And um, so let's hear that. So that's the that is the march uh, movement, and you know more of more development of those ideas. But once again, um, it's the same now after this introduction. So the introduction here, this little rhythm is borrowed from uh, you know this little section uh, of the humoresque. Um, da -da 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 uh, uh, right? So you get that rhythm that's introduced. Maybe it was introduced somewhere else also, but that's where I just remembered it from. Because um, he's actually tying these things together because that happens. But this little figure, um, uh, now I'm losing track of where I'm at. Um, this little figure here in the horn is taken from the very first movement. And I think I stopped before you got to hear it there. But um, uh, here we go. So we got to hear that figure there in the very first movement. Um, so he's using little themes from other movements and tying all the piece together, and it's also tied together by the melody. So, so far here, we haven't heard the main melody yet, right? It's just using other ideas that were, frankly, these were Jim's ideas. I don't know that they were in Heiss's piece. The bump, 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 ba dump, and the boop, bump, bump. Those were Jim's ideas. Maybe he stole them from some other part of Heiss's piece originally, but they're not the main melody. But here comes the main melody. So that's that same melody. Remember, it was boop, ba da da. No, boop, ba da da do da bo da ba da da da. That was the melody originally. The pickups are missing. Boo da bum. Oops. Let me undo that change. Boo da dum. Bum 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 boom bum 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 bum. So in this case, he has put it into four four. Maybe it's cut time again. Yeah, cut time, but uh, same difference. Um, he's he's moved it there, but now he's actually changed it a lot. He's the C was on the downbeat, but remember it was C D C D was the next downbeat in the original. If I'm, I gotta make sure I'm actually not lying. C D C D E. So the original melody went C E C D E as far as the downbeats went. Let's hear it again. C, D, E. So it had a nice rising quality to it. The new version is moved into four, but it's been moved into a four in a way that again changes where the downbeats are. So now the next downbeat is the C, not this D. That D was the one that was the downbeat in the original. And then the E is a downbeat again, but now it's um, you know it's not a long note. These long notes are the more prominent notes, and this E now is noticeably shorter than those whole notes, whereas in the original they were all quarter notes. So Jim's found a lot of ways of getting some really interesting mileage out of that melody by really pretty completely reimagining it. So it's a much larger scale change than what Sam did with Trevor's piece, right? That was very recognizably all the same things, just, you know, change what octave this is in, voice these chords differently. This is 
these are completely new reimaginings of that melody. And it's all cool. It's all good stuff. And I just love to see this kind of collaboration. That's one of the things that this community, um, any community is good for. But it's one of the things that I was hoping to create here is not just a sense of me talking and you all out there individually in your own little worlds, but that's, you know, all working together. And that's also, once again, tying together, tying into the uh, the uh, Jazz Piano Holiday Course. It's going to be cohort-based, meaning we're all going through it together. And uh, um, we'll all kind of be working on the same concepts at the same time and able to give each other feedback. And uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a really fun experience. So um, speaking of that, I know I've been speaking about it a lot, but I've just been hinting at it. I do want to talk about one specific thing um, about that course. And I, I I want to be really pretty precise about what I'm going to be teaching in it. And because um, I've, I've, I've written things and I've said things in videos or whatever about this, but I want to talk a little bit about what Jazz Piano is and what it isn't and what, uh, or not so much what it isn't, but what we're going to be dealing with. So Jazz Piano, I mean, as soon as we say the word jazz, we generally mean there's some improvisation involved. But improvisation doesn't mean just sit here and go and do whatever the heck you want, right? Improvisation typically is over a structure. And usually it's a specific chord progression you start with and you're improvising a new melody over it. But you don't even start with that. You start by playing the original melody, maybe with your own personalized interpretation of that melody. Then you'll launch into some improvisation. Not all jazz is structured that way, but a lot is. So. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the improvisation so much in this. I'm going to talk about how we're going to structure our our melody, how we're going to play a recognizable melody in our style, the way a typical jazz performance would be before all the improvisation stuff. Now, if I were playing, say, Jingle Bells, uh, I might, you know, do that if I'm not thinking very hard. And if I decide to work at it a little harder, I didn't actually mean to do the bop, but, um, but hey, it was cool. Um, it's just because I'm still not seated comfortably. Um, I, I just played that three different ways, right? That's improvised. I, I didn't work any of those out. But often we do work those things out. We'll work out, okay, I'm going to work, I'm going to voice this this way, voice that, that this other way. And so I want to walk through that process, and I'm going to, I want someone to name a familiar uh, holiday song. And I'm just going to write one measure of it here so you can watch the process and see what it is specifically that we're going to work on. So uh, that's my challenge, someone name a song. <laughs> Um, because I don't, I, I, you know, I want this to not just be, oh, this is what I worked out. No, this is, um, this is going to be something, um, something new. So I want someone to name me a song for me to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to work on. And I'm just going to take one measure and walk through my process. So the process is going to be, I'm going to first figure out the melody by ear. I'm going to syncopate it like I talked about. Maybe there'll be a little Here's Johnny in it. Um, so, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Perfect. Um, so, Hark the Herald Angels. So, I got to think about, I got to play this by ear, and I got to think in my head what key do I want it in? Where was the first note relative to that key? Do, da, da, do, da, 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 da. And I, I, I kind of want the melody to sit around here. So, so I, I, in my head, really quickly worked out that it didn't start on scale degree one, that it started on five, it started with a leap up, and I worked it out by ear. In first lesson, I go into that in a lot more detail. So, so I will, will so, so one, two, three. So I don't want to have bum bum bum. I want to have something um, jazzier, and and that's just going to consist of figuring out ways of syncopating it. So that note that was on three, I'm going to move it. I'm either going to move it a half a beat earlier or later. Boop, boom, or boop, bum, bum. I didn't like that one. It felt awkward and stilted for that melody. But boop, ba, da, da, do, ba, da, da. okay, got my first phrase. Now I'm going to just figure out how to harmonize it with one, four, and five. It's either going to be C, G, C, or D underneath it. Boop, ba, 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 
There we go. So it's bum ba, 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 da, ba. I like that too. Ba, da, ba. Now, lyrically, hark the herald. It might be that. Boom. Ba, da, da, ba, ba, da, da. So it starts with a G, then goes to a five. All right, now I want to take that five, make it a two five. Alright, I got some more chords. Now I want to connect um, and not just sit on that G. I don't just want to sit on that G for a whole measure. And so I've got a whole lot of like little formulas, and they're not my formulas, all jazz musicians know these. Ways of getting from that one to the two. One, four, three, six. It's a great one. Maybe that was too many chords. I'll simplify it to just one and six. Oh, I'm throwing in all this other stuff, sorry. So, just melody and root. But then we will. We're going to use our thumbs to fill in thirds and sevenths. This already is a third. So I've got a seventh here. I've got my fifth there. And then, maybe I'll do this to avoid doubling uh, the G. And then... I'm just filling in thirds and sevenths in the middle. Now I'll fill in more notes. And they're all from the key. And I'll talk about how we pick those. And then we're going to pick in the juicy color tones that go outside the key. The dominant chords can get flat nines. So. There's the flat nine. But then I'll also talk about these little moving lines where chords move with the melody. It's still a D chord, but I got several notes moving. Each one of these things I go into way more detail and we work them out. And so, yeah, by the end of a few weeks, you've got. or something very akin to that. So, that's and tons more on top of it. But it's that kind of step by step. First, let's work out this melody. Now, let's figure out some really basic chords. Now, we're going to slightly jazzify the chords, not by complicating how we play them, but just inserting some new chords. So it's not just one, four, and five. And um, then we'll worry about adding the thirds and sevenths to these chords to make sure we're hearing the chords. And then we start adding all the color and everything, and then moving things around. and. That's the, it's a process you can go through, and I guarantee you, I can have you writing something or playing something that feels not too, not too different from what I just did. So anyhow, that's the process. Um, okay. Oh, is it Arbor Day now? No, Arbor Day was like a month ago, wasn't it? Um, or two. So I got a, a bunch of uh, choices in here for other songs that I could have picked, but I saw the Hark the Herald Angels sing first. I just wanted to show the concept there, but, you know, during the course, maybe we'll use those other ones as examples here and there. So uh, that's my, my spiel um, uh, for you. I, I really uh, highly recommend, if you haven't already done so, to consider uh, signing up. So I'm going to just post that link, and then I'll go on and take a look at one more piece here. Um, so, mm -mm, and, mm, so this is, uh, I got to type, it's harder for me to type with the computer up on, on this tear. Mastering use score.com slash P slash jazz piano holiday. There we go. There's the link. Um, let me click it, make sure I got it right. Okay, okay, cool. So, end of commercial. And, um, uh, yeah, it's good. It's just, we're just going to all kind of go through at this pace of learning these techniques over the course of a few weeks. So, I said I want to uh, get one more piece in here to look at. And um, there's several things that were uh, posted here. Um, one of the ones that I guess I would want to look at here is one that was commented on that I haven't actually had an opportunity to hear yet because uh, what happened apparently, I think uh, Nick who wrote it and posted it must have been using a different sound font. 
is my assumption here because people were commenting, hey, we can't hear anything unless you download it in a MuseScore and then tweak things. So that typically means he must have already, he must have been using a non-default sound font that he set up to do that. So as a result, I haven't heard it yet, um, but when I press play, I hear nothing, right? And that's because, yeah, all the instruments must be set up. So uh, differently. So I'm going to go to page view here and just point this out. So, oh, I see now. He's The reason he's in continuous view, he's got too many instruments for his page. Let me fix that. So I'm going to go to page settings and just pick some bigger paper so that it actually fits on a printed page. Oh, wow. What's going on? My system. Oh, I guess this must be a big score. That's all I can say. First of all, if I go to portrait mode instead of landscape mode, hey, that's already enough right there. I think I'm, I think I'm done. Just by going to portrait mode, everything fits on the page. So good. All right. Um, so then I would need to go to the mixer. If I go to view mixer here, um, I'm, oh my gosh, look, everything is muted. It's not that he was using a non-default sound font. He just had muted things. So I just need to unsolo the voice. And by the way, you don't need to do both those things. If you solo an instrument, you're only going to hear that instrument. You don't ever have to mute everything. And it's kind of a pain because it means now it's going to take me a while to unmute things. But it'll be worth it because people said it was a good piece and I trust them. And they're all good pieces. All right. There we go. And I'm going to save that because I know I'm not going to want to have the original version and have to do this again. All right. So uh, I just want to play a little bit of it. And this will be my very first time hearing it. I'm just going to play a minute or so and talk about what I hear. That is wonderful. Not um, not what I was expecting based on the introduction. That's why this big smile came across my face because it was such a surprise. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there's lots of fun, great stuff that's happening after that, although it looks like there's meant to be some improvisation. So probably it'll be a little, uh, um, yeah, it's a saxophone solo. So we won't really get to hear what's actually happening. Yeah. There's meant to be a saxophone improvised solo through that section. So yeah, that is really cool. And and one of, so one of the reasons I smiled um, the way I did was nothing about this introduction. Led me to expect the swing I was about to get, and it came as a surprise because uh, you know right here we're still hearing that introduction feel. That boo ba doo da line was swung eighth notes. And I was like, oh, was that a mistake? Because I wasn't expecting it. Um, 
And I thought maybe he just accidentally mm -hmm. put some swing text because people do that sometimes. Sometimes people will be on the text palette and they see swing here and they're like, yeah, whatever. I just see boldface text and I want to use it. Um, and so they will use that as a way of just getting boldface text. That's not not the way to get generic boldface text, by the way. Instead, select a note and just pick regular staff text or use control T. But then you can go to the inspector over here on the right and uh, make it bold by clicking the bold button. Anyhow, uh, this isn't the Music or Cafe, but I wanted to point that out. Um, so uh, yeah, it's not that Nick made a mistake, but at first, that was my first thought was, oh, he did that thing that people often do of accidentally making something swing that they didn't mean to. But then, of course, we hear the melody. And then, I'll, I'll, and then I'm like, okay, yes, he actually did mean this thing to swing. So um, one question that I have, and I shouldn't, well, I don't know. I that melody sounds familiar, but I can't place it. So Nick, I don't know. Is that making conversation and hanging out, uh, cracking the usual crazy lines, neighboring table? So I don't know. I don't know if you actually like wrote the melody and the lyrics, or if this is an existing song that you, oh, lyrics as well, it's someone else that I don't know. So I'm guessing that it's a piece that you co-wrote with someone, very cool, it, it's, it has the air of familiarity about it, um, which is a good thing to have. Um, if Because if it sounds too unlike anything else, it's hard to relate to. So th this melody sounds very relatable. So the introduction is its own little world, but I'm going to like focus on the main body of the piece because one of the other things that I um, um, smiled at was what happens uh, a couple of places in the melody, but here's one right here. Uh, remember just like 20 minutes ago or so, uh, we were looking at one of Jim's uh, variations there, and one of them had changed the melody around so the, the phrase ended on beat two. And I said, you don't see that every day. But we saw it twice today, didn't we? Because <laughs> here's, a, here's a, a melody line. The, dun, 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 the one, two. So that's the situation in which you do see it in a jazz context where we're going for some syncopations. And it wasn't just there. Actually, there were several other aspects of the melody that um, uh, kind of had a, a focus on beat two. That's just the one that I'm seeing right now. There were there were definitely others. So um, also then relevant to what I was saying about um, I was just looking to see if I could find one of the others, but I'm not. Oh, right here. This is this one is the and of one, not two, but it's the same thing. Remember how I talked about that? Here's Johnny, the Johnny Carson theme, and how it's really just ba -dum -bum -bum, but it's one and it just syncopated one note. That C B is really C B. It's really two quarter notes that. Um, one of them got moved half a beat earlier. I'm not saying that literally it was ever written that way, but that's how these rhythms come about. They're, they start off life in the inner part of the brain as a simple melody that by the time it comes out, maybe gets syncopated. And so everything about this, like ba do da da boo da bum, that could be simplified also to Really, kind of what's happening um, is that there's an octave change in there, but uh, I think someone else doesn't have it. Yeah, so all, all the other instruments there don't have the octave jump. Is really the melody, but that A instead of showing up on the off beat got displaced to half a beat. So. Um, by just delaying the A half a beat, we accomplish two things. You get this B gets to be syncopated because otherwise it was just like a little eighth note on the end of four leading to one. That's what eighth notes on the end of four usually do, lead into one. One and two and three and four and one. We expect the and of four to be followed by one. So by taking the A and moving it away, the B suddenly gets more prominent because it would have been and you barely would have been aware of the beat. But now, 
Oh, that boo boo da, that little short note on the and of four, not immediately followed by something on on one, that calls the ear's attention to it. That syncopation, and then the a was originally supposed to be on one, supposed to be. You know what I mean? Um, it you know that would have been the unsyncopated version. But by moving it to the end of one, it is also syncopated now because it could have been on one, but now it's on an off beat. So he's by just moving that one note by half a beat, it's created two syncopations. Off, off. Those are two off beats in a row. And um, yeah, that sort of stuff. You know, I could go through the rest of the melody then. Bum, boo, ba, boo, doo, dum. Could have been bum. Could have been bum, boo, ba, ba, dum, bum. Could have been E, D, C, B, with the C as a quarter note. E, D, C as a quarter note. That B could have come in on one. Boo, ba, dum, bum. But he again moved that B. Uh, a half a beat earlier, so that instead of being bum bum bum, bum it became boom boom boom, ah, and then tied across, so that it still it still does actually live on beat one. It just got there a half a beat early, so that anticipation. So anyhow, that, that those are the things that struck me about this, and because it it was something I could e easily relate to something that I had just been talking about, it was just like, you know, I'm just this big grin is showing up on my face here. So. Um, uh, so yeah, those are some of the things that I um, am noticing and uh, relating to in this piece. There's a lot of just really fun things going on in it musically. Uh, and then he's got that solo section. And so, but just focusing on what's happening here, he's, he's also got, um, you know, it's arranged for an ensemble that's not a jazz band exactly. I mean, it's a flute, an oboe, a clarinet, and a couple saxophones. And is that really a bassoon? Yep, it's a bassoon and a horn. So it's essentially like a small concert band kind of set up, but with a string section also. And, um, you know, some drums in here also. But the drums are really, it says drum set, but I either this was not, either this was maybe transcribed in from some other software in which these would have had other sounds because really all I'm hearing are snares right everything is snare rather than you know I'm imagining that maybe it was originally meant to be something else um, um, but uh, in any case you know actually one of the things that I'm going to point out about this drum part here um, it feels, yeah, it feels like not a drum set thing. It feels like a, 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 you know, a military snare kind of thing. But it reminds me of when I was a kid. My father was not a musician. He loved music, classical music especially. Um, and uh, But he wasn't a musician. And so I didn't learn anything in particular about music from him except one thing. And so I'm going to teach it to you. <laughs> it's not really mu that much of a teach. But um, and then I'm going to uh, be on my way here. Um, I remember as a kid, and probably I was six or seven, I remember where it was. It was in the house that we used to live in in Connecticut that he actually designed. Um, and uh, we were sitting by the fireplace, and some song was maybe on the radio. And we were sitting by the fireplace, and I picked up like the fireplace poker, and I was using it like a drumstick. And I was using it to go like this. Um, I'm going to just do it. In other words, I was basically using the drumstick to play the melody um, because I didn't know any better. Um, and it was my father, of all people, who pointed out to me that that's, that's not what drummers usually do. The drummers don't echo the melody. They keep a steady beat. I, I, don't, I don't know where this came from in him that he heard this and uh, felt... Uh, like uh, it was the time to tell me this, but yeah, that's like the one thing I learned about music from my father. And I, I, I always remember that story when, when I think about this sort of thing. So at some level, it feels like that. It feels like this ding, 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 bump. Bum, 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 bum. It feels like the drums are essentially playing the melody. Now, not exactly, because it's not playing every single note, right? It's picking up the accents. That's, that is something that happens in 
in an ensemble in which maybe you have multiple percussionists, you have one person, like in a concert band situation, it's not a drum set. One person's playing a snare, someone else has got some cymbals, someone else has got the big bass drum. So you're creating a beat maybe out of all those different instruments, and maybe someone's part does involve accentuating the melody. Normally it wouldn't be this much though. So if it were me, I might get rid of those uh, quarter notes there and keep only this uh, this little syncopation here. Maybe I'd put one on the end of four also. So uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put in uh, an eighth rest, and then I'm going to put in a crash symbol. There we go. And then I'm going to change that guy to a crash symbol. All right, and I'll get rid of this stuff too. And I just want you to hear what this sounds like. Um, so I'm going to do this. First, I'm going to play the original version. So I'm going to undo all that. And I want you to hear them side by side so you hear what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's the original version. And now I'm going to redo all my changes. And you're going to hear it with just those two syncopations being picked up by the crash symbol. All right, that's probably too much. And maybe that silence there isn't what I'm looking for. In a jazz setting, I would expect it to be more like a ride cymbal pattern. So I'm going to change those to, to cymbals, which is one of the things that I'm wondering if he actually meant, but something went wrong in the software. So I'm just going to enter and then an eighth note here. So we're still going to hear the beat, but it's going to be on a ride cymbal and then the crash on the end of four. That's the kind of thing that we typically do in putting a drum beat together. We want to mark time somehow, maybe not just quarter notes, but whatever, and then also pick up the accents and not play every note of the melody, um, but not ignore the melody. So there's sort of an art to this, and uh, in any case, that was something that I saw in there. So, um, uh, so Kika, yeah, I think what happened is uh, your country probably just went in, just went off of daylight savings time. The United States is about to do that next week, so next week's schedule is going to be different. I mean, I, it's always 10:30 for me. It's always 12:30 Eastern, but what that looks like in the rest of the world can change. So I'll make sure I mention that in the newsletter next week. Um, but I got to be moving. So I'm going to finish out just by playing one more time for people who haven't seen it, my uh, Christmas tree arrangement that I, I, I did this literally like in, you know, whipped it out in about an hour because I wanted to kind of show the process of um, working out this piece slowly. And I'm going to try to play it because I should be able to play it. I have played it, but I can't play and look at it there. So I'm going to look at it here. Um, here we go. It starts off, it, it basically echoes the process. So you'll see it starting off as simply as we're going to start the first week and then starting to layer in just the bass notes, then layering in the two fives, then layering in some more chords, then layering in thirds and sevenths, then color tones, and etc. So you'll, you'll, this is a, the entire jazz piano holiday course in a microcosm here. So pretty much everything that's in that arrangement is the stuff that I'm going to be uh, talking about in the course. So I really hope you all join us and uh, we get started tomorrow. So if you haven't already enrolled, now's the time. So I hope everyone has enjoyed this session. I, I enjoy doing these sessions at the keyboard. I'll be doing them for the, basically the next few weeks also while we uh, work through the course. Um, so I wanted to make sure I had the setup all, all working smoothly. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun, and hope you all learned something. Keep writing music, keep submitting music. For the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the submissions from people participating in the course, so you'll be hearing, you know, uh, stuff being built up in the same way that you just saw there. 
Um, so uh, by all means, though, even if you're not participating in the course, keep writing other stuff and uh, we'll get to it when we can. Hope everyone has a great week and I'll see you next week. Um, again, it'll possibly be a different time depending on how the time zone things worked out. Um, but uh, it'll, it's going to be 1230 Eastern, but it'll be 1730 Eastern. Uh, Greenwich time, GMT or UTC as they call, call it, universal time. So um, it'll be 1730 for those of you who like to calculate from GMT. So I will see you all next week. Thanks everyone and uh, have, a, have a good one. Hope to see you in the course.